Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here in, in Boston, and thank you for this great invitation and opportunity to be here on a beautiful fall day. And we're going to be talking about, first, who are the learners? I am joined by, going from my left, um, Aaron Nepler from Public Agenda, Robert Lytle from Parthenon, and John Della Volpe from the Harvard Institute of Politics. Before I turn to them, I want to just throw out some ideas about this question of who are the learners, which might seem a very obvious question to those of you who work in colleges and universities, and you're like, well, yeah, they're the people I see every day scurrying to class. But I want to dig a little deeper into this question of who are the learners, and to throw out the possibility that maybe many of the leaders of colleges don't know who the learners are. And so I'm going to start with a story on today's website in which we sort of teased a university president. Um, he's not in New England, so I try not to tease the presidents of, uh, of places where I'm going to be speaking that day. And, and this is a president who was frustrated that too many students were moving off campus. And he prefers that students live off campus. And he gave a talk in which he said that students were moving off campus to be libertines, to have a lot of sex and drink a lot. <laughs> and the students got very angry. And the students pointed out a few things. One is they're quite capable of drinking and having sex in the dorms. <laughs> Who knew? But the other thing that they quickly said was that the reason they're moving off campus is it's much less expensive than living on campus. And so it's frugality, not sex, that they say is the key factor. Now it's interesting, I don't know who's right because I don't know exactly what's going on in the off-campus apartments there. But what's interesting is a college president assumed he knew the motivation for what students were doing. And the student said, no, you actually have no clue. And, and I think that that, may be, that that example has to do with where students live. But I think we're in a period of rapid change about who the learners are. And I think that affects policies about teaching and learning, about financial aid, about everything, about the way institutions are organized. So when people talk about the way learners are, and students are changing, the most obvious ways that they're changing concern demographics. And so students today are far more diverse than they once were, um, uh, by, certainly by race and ethnicity. Many institutions that once were fairly monochromatic are no longer so, and that's a great thing. Um, in some areas, they are changing rapidly. Once institutions were predominantly male, now many institutions are predominantly female. Um, the share of students who had a good high school education is shrinking as the share of the population going to college has gone up. Um, and there is increasingly a sense that where the action is in higher education isn't just the elite institutions that teach the best prepared students. Age changes. You have both traditional college age and a growing non-traditional college age. You have focus on different subsets of students, veterans, older students, students from parts of states that may not be well served, rural, urban, and so forth. But I would suggest that underlying those demographic changes are some even more philosophical changes about who the learners are. Uh, and this comes from my discussions with college leaders as they talk about who they want to get, who they're educating. So one question I have about learners is when you talk about learners, are you talking about the learners you have or the learners you want? Uh, I hear a lot of people talking about how we're going to do X, Y, and Z to get, then fill in the blank of that demographic group. And they're talking about the learners they wish they had. Um, are you talking about learners who you think you actually control their learning experience? We are increasingly in an era where students mix and match. They transfer from institution to institution. They take some courses online. They learn from all kinds of other experiences. And yet, many colleges assume that whatever their mission is, they define what the learners will do. Um, are you assuming that learners are committed to some sort of passive receiving knowledge from on high 
that you are providing when increasingly students have no interest in such a sense. When you think about learners, are you thinking about what goes on in your classrooms or what goes on out of your classrooms? If you're Northeastern, to take a good Nebi uh, institution, you're famous for the learning that goes on in co-op experiences outside the classroom. If you're UMass Online, you're educating students in their homes. Um, this idea that the learners are in a single place is really important. And then finally, when you talk about learners, are you talking about those who are succeeding at your institutions or those who are dropping out or failing at your institutions? Um, so I throw these out not because there are perfect or easy answers to any of these questions, but just to say that what seems a simple question, who are the learners, I would argue is much more complex. And, and figuring out who are your learners, I think, is essential to fulfilling your missions. So we're going to start with each of our panelists describing <coughs> briefly some of the ideas that they have about looking at who are the learners. Then we'll talk a bit, and then we will involve you. And there's going to be a free gift at the end, so stay, stay engaged. So um, Aaron, how do you think about this issue of who are the learners? Thanks, Scott. And thank you for inviting me for being here this morning. Um, so when I think about the learners, I think about exactly what you were talking about, the fact that we've moved greatly towards a more uh, the non-traditional or becoming our traditional students, and we really need to meet them where they are. Many of them are coming in, as you mentioned, um, with military experience. Many of them have been out of high school and been working for a while. You mentioned that um, we think about our students maybe not necessarily having that high school prep that good high school preparation that we think is essential for them to be college ready. But when you think about it, if they're coming back and they're non-traditional students, it's not that they haven't had that great high school experience, it's that they've been out for a while and they've been working. And what do we need to do to meet them where they are so that they can come in and they can be prepared and ready to meet the challenges, as well as how can we get it so that it works with their schedule. Um, many of them are working, they have families. What do we need to do to make that happen? Um, one example of that is competency-based education, being able to take the student experience and apply that to their learning situation. So they come in, they can get prior learning assessment, they can get credit for having those workplace experiences, and then they can also be able to demonstrate what they've learned on the job within the classroom and really making that strong connection from what we're seeing in the workplace to what they're learning in the classroom. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot with our students today. They want to have and they want to get some real value out of their education. They want to be able to make sure that what they are doing in the job applies in the classroom and vice versa. And I think that that's one of the, the really big changes that we're seeing around competency-based is that the fact that students can really be able to show and demonstrate what they know so that they can be able to move forward with their career in a, in a very viable way for their future. Thanks. Robert? For Scott, I'm excited about the um the gift here is this going to be like an Oprah style car under the chair? It's not a car. It's oh, not a car. Right. We're disappointed now. <laughs> um, yeah, listen, it, you know, there, it, it, it's popular to say, you know, when you talk about changes in the learner centric model of their learner needs, that, you know, the generational differences, but generations have been different every generation for millennial. So that's true, but I don't think that's the big change. I, I would posit there are three major events that have happened um, really since the turn of the century. Uh, first, the demands of the workforce have rapidly altered um, at a pace that, in fairness, universities have not kept up with, um, although they will, they'll catch up soon enough, um, but also that student selection hasn't kept up with, right? And you see all sorts of interesting new academic models coming in to kind of solve for that problem, boot camps and things like that. Um, the second thing that's happened is we have actually been incredibly successful over the past more 15 to 25 years of expanding access to students in this nation. So the number of people in a post-secondary credential now who would not have been able to access that uh, 15 or 20 years ago is absolutely astronomical. And so it's not a surprise that those new people coming into the system are running in a system that's not always exactly tuned up to their specific needs or the type of experience they're seeking. Um, and the third thing that's happened is we've had this explosion of alternative models of education in the post-secondary space, um, many of which were around for a long time but have now had gas thrown onto them by changes in technology, so different modalities, you know, the rise of online, um, different models, competency-based, um, taking what used to be a CLEP and moving it into credit for assessment, uh, MOOCs, um, and 
recently, actually not even recently, actually through successive administrations, the Department of Education, that has actually been reasonably willing to allow experimental sites to pop up and for people to experiment with this thing. And, you know, very recently, completely different non-credit hour type of uh, education can now, you know, apply for and run with Title IV money. So all of those have, have offered up all these different modalities. And I think what you're really looking at is a world that has a level of segmentation in terms of consumer needs that is not quite being matched yet by the sophistication of the service value proposition. They're coming, they're coming very rapidly. Uh, but I'm not sure the world is quite caught up with that yet. And over the next five to 10 years, I think you'll see those two things connect as institutions start to really understand different segments of students out there and tune their value propositions up to appeal specifically to them. John? Um, thanks again um, for, for having me this morning. And um, if it's okay, I'm gonna offer a kind of a different perspective and, and context. I owe uh, my place here, I think, kind of on this, on this stage to learners. It wasn't my idea to become the director of polling at the Institute of Politics at Harvard 15 years ago. It was two 19-year-olds, right, who were frustrated that it seemed like everyone in their school at Harvard, but in their high schools across the country, their friends, their peer group, were very active volunteering in some kind of community service activity, but were not voting and participating in the political activities that they thought were necessary to move the country forward. So it was their idea to create a program um, that would begin to study this. And that program, frankly, kind of changed my life. And I think it's an experience um, of one small kind of uh, anecdote about what um, students think about. They think about kind of practical applications. They think about creating programs that they can be a part of. And thankfully, in, the, in that case, I think um, they provide a lot of value to the academic community, the political community, media, et cetera. So over the course of the 15 years, I've led this study, arguably, I think, the largest study uh, on the millennial generation. And I think there are three or four key insights that I can offer from that perspective that are, I think, kind of intertwined with the conversation this morning. Um, the first is, um, as I said, they seek practical ways to make a difference. You know, other than a presidential year, you'll see more young people volunteer uh, on campus than vote, right? More young people will volunteer than vote. Not because they, they think, uh, not because they're apathetic, but because they care deeply about the country. So finding specific practical ways to kind of engage them through that process um, is key. And we've seen a kind of a long experience um, of that working um, that I think can be connected here, number one. Number, number two is not all young people are the same. So we, we talk about um, the kind of the, the diverse college university in, the, in, in, in New England, in the United States. I think it, um, the kind of the social experiences where young, young people grow up, different parts of the country, different levels of education, different parts of the world kind of inform the way in which they think about kind of success in the workplace. And we can talk about that hopefully kind of today. And the third is they seek opportunities for analysis, debate, discussion. I conducted a focus group of uh, 55 students, kind of a town meeting with a couple dozen universities. And one of the most surprising elements of that was one of the criticisms this group had, and these were folks from public universities to private universities, they talked about the lack of safe space um, in their college to have basic political conversations. And it was just as relevant from the folks who were supporting candidates on the right as candidates on the left. That lack of safe space was of, uh, of concern to them and certainly kind of a, a concern and a, and, a and a surprise to me. So I'm gonna offer kind of broader perspectives about kind of the context of this generation and um, I look forward to the conversation, so thank you. Um, so I wanna start by asking a show of hands question of the audience. Um, we heard references to competency-based education, online education, MOOCs, um, how many of you are at institutions where a majority of undergraduate education takes place outside the traditional classroom enroll in courses and get credit method? I see just a handful. How many of you, uh, a third of undergraduate education takes place in these non-traditional modes? Okay, so again, so what we're seeing is that while these new forms are getting a lot of buzz, a lot of interest, at least among attendees here, that may or may not be a scientific sample, um, more interest than adoption. Um, and I'm curious, um, Aaron, Robert, what do you make of that? Should that concern people in New England? 
there. Yeah, and yeah, it should concern because our learners are demanding a, a different modality and they want the, the material to be delivered in a, in a different way. Um, Public Agenda, we do a lot of work with competency-based education, and we recently um, put on a convening a few weeks ago, and it was called CBE Exchange, and it was basically a, a safe place where people could learn about competency-based education. And um, what we saw in that was that there were representations from over 200 different types of institutions at this particular convening. And about 60% of them were in that very small space where they're just starting to dabble in it. Um, and what we're seeing is that the demands of the learner are not keeping up with what the institutions are being able to provide for their students. And there are a number of reasons that go into that, um, specifically for competency-based education. It's a risky space for institutions to enter into. Um, there are aspects like financial aid that come into play. Um, there Federal financial aid through Title IV cannot be um, except if you're a part of an experimental site. It can't. You can't offer financial aid to students um, if, they're, if the, the modality is not based on. a chance for something that may or may not work and that's what we're doing a lot with competency-based education is that we're constantly taking the risk to see if traditionally done it. Robert, thoughts? So should you be worried? Um, it depends on the type of school you are who you're trying to serve. If the majority of folks out there represent small private liberal arts colleges, it doesn't surprise me all that much that you're still primarily classroom-based education. I would also tell you that that market is challenged and shrinking. Um, if you're serving adult learners, working professionals, and you're not online, and you're not thinking through competency-based education, which may be just an experimental site now, but certainly tests well in the marketplace, I would say you should be worried. Um, if you're taking degree completers, right, working adults and degree completers, um, you're trying to do that in a classroom, then you've got a value proposition that's not aligned with that segment of the marketplace. So to me, it absolutely comes down to who are you trying to serve and working backwards from that population group's needs and then assessing your value proposition. That said, um, the number of hands that went up is not resonant with the marketplace at large, right? So if you are representative of the marketplace at large, more hands should have gone up, um, certainly at the majority and the one-third one -third online. But maybe we have a slightly skewed sample of them. So, John, I wanted to follow up on what you said about how students want places to learn how to analyze issues, have good discussions, tough discussions. Do you think, when you hear about these new modalities, uh, competency-based education, online, mixed, hybrid courses, whatever, do you feel that the students, that those students, many of whom are non-traditional students, adult students, do they want that too, or are you talking about what traditional age undergrads want? I, um, I, think, I think all young adults, I think all, all, all adults, I think it has a lot to do with the, like the news cycle. I'll give you an example. Um, we used to do a lot of uh, to work with trying to, trying to kind of connect, make newspapers relevant. So a lot of like the big national newspapers are trying to find a way to sell subscriptions to young people, and it's a very difficult thing to do, but the one part of the news that they that they were looking for is analysis, commentary, and those sorts of things. So I think kind of the need to kind of analyze um, and to have different perspectives is just key to, to this generation, right? This is a generation that is connected to young people kind of around the world based on a variety of different experiences they've had, and they're able to keep in touch with those young people in, in ways that are different than the way in which kind of we and most of the people in, in this room grew up. So I think they constantly seek ways to kind of engage other people in trying to solve problems. That's the reason that so many of, the, of them are engaged in social media, um, to kind of exchange those ideas, and I think um, learners of both sides of the, of the fence would seek those opportunities. Um, Aaron, as you look at, say, competency-based education, does it do a good job of providing space 
analyze, debate, work together, um, things that in traditional higher ed, a lot went on in general education to offer those experiences. Does competency-based education do that? Um, I think that's one of the myths that you'll see, especially not just with competency-based education, but with online, is that you're, you're in a room, you're by yourself, and you can't ever connect. Um, but what we're seeing is that more people are connecting in ways that they've never connected before. Connection, connection doesn't just happen um, by looking someone in the eyes. Uh, it can happen in a variety of ways. And so what we're seeing is that students are feeling a great sense of connection. Um, one of the, um, the areas that competency-based education has gotten a lot of beef in recent months and in, in, in the past few years is about um, whether or not faculty can have in engagement with the student. And what we're seeing is that there is quite a bit of engagement and students are able to connect in a way that they haven't before. Um, they're able to talk with their faculty um, in not in their office hours, they're able to connect with them over email, over text, over various chats. And they're able to see that they're able to have much more of that relationship and that dialogue and that they are being able to create a space where they can engage and they can um, debate and have analytical discussions in order to really get at the issues that we're talking about. And Scott, I want to put on that because, you know, it, people going through an educational experience in general like to engage in debate about things, but the nature of that debate does change over time, right? So a 35-year-old working professional who's getting a competency-based degree in business probably doesn't want to engage with their peers around politics and things. But they do want to engage with their peers around how to do things, what's going on in the business world, what type of trends in marketing are taking place, right? So it's just the nature of those conversations naturally mutate over time and they change with different groups of people. And I think we've seen over and over that digital forums, if constructed properly, monitored properly, can certainly create that type of environment um, for discussion. And for many individuals in it is actually a superior um, place to have those discussions because it lowers a lot of the boundaries of, of confidence and feeling like you're shut down and things like that. So it can actually help create a very safe place for those types of discussions to go on. Uh, more show of the audience, show of hands. How many of you have taken an online course for credit as a student? Okay, lots. How many of you have taught an online course? Okay, lots. Um, do you, and I guess what I want to get at is the question of not is online superior or inferior, but are policymakers embracing things that will make online inferior? And by that I mean, say, um, student faculty ratios such that there's actually no chance at all that a faculty member will have an individual relationship with students. Like in Did, a MOOC. Like a MOOC or, or even many large non-MOOC mm -hmm. programs. Is that a concern? I mean, do you think that's going on? Does that concern you? You just described my accounting 101 class in 1986. That's, that's true. Well, well, but that, that's, I went to class. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And what I notice is a lot of people advocating reform, their first answer is, well, but the status quo is mediocre. And they may well be correct, but my question is, if the status quo is mediocre at many universities, is that what we want to replicate and move online? <laughs> well, um, I, I will say that one of the, the key values, I think, that this generation, from kind of my perspective, kind of treasures is flexibility, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and obviously kind of disruption. And I think that one of the lessons I often offer, my, my responsibility at Harvard's part-time, advise um, very traditional institutions on how to modernize, including the Marine Corps, is help them help you, okay? Is that, um, that young people seek ways to make an impact every day, and if they don't see it in a classroom, they'll find ways to learn outside of the classroom and do whatever makes the most sense to maintain this flexible schedule. So because they're choosing a, kind of a, a path to learn outside the classroom, that works for some people, but um, doesn't mean that in my you know, kind of uh, opinion that the college university can find ways to connect that experience online with, with off online with other offline opportunities as well, because it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, certainly because I think a, a young person um, 
looks for other, lots of different kinds of experiences over the course of the five or six years um, that they think about um, in the late teens or early 20s about education. One of the most important factors that they seek to, um, to find is something that they can be proud of doing, right? Something they can mm -hmm. be proud of. It's a, it's a very different generation than the generation I was raised in and Generation X in terms of we've, we found success based on how much money was in the bank or the kind of car or house that you had. This, this generation seeks flexibility in doing something they can be proud of, whether it's online or offline. I think one of the encouraging things, and I'll say this is an encouraging thing out of the Department of Education recently, is a shift in the experimental sites to say, tell me what you're trying to accomplish, your claims, and then show me how you're doing against those claims. And I think that's the way we should evaluate these things. Um, we're 15, 20 years into a lot of these experimental journeys here, so let's not pretend that we have it right yet. Um, that said, what we do know is that different environments are right for the different right situation. Um, Let's take an online MOOC for general ed, an introductory class, right? XYZ 101. Is a fully online MOOC with no faculty interaction the appropriate environment for most students to take that when they're 18 years old? No. But it's appropriate for some subset of those students, right? And they should be allowed to do that. And if it works for them, fantastic. Now they don't have to sit through the class. Let's take a kind of a remedial general education class. There's a lot of emerging evidence that would say a highly structured digital environment that is I'll call it semi-adaptive in nature, combined with a once a week tutorial with a non-PhD faculty member is an extraordinarily powerful way to bridge that gap, much more powerful than sitting in class for three to four hours a week with a faculty member, right? We should experiment with that, learn and get better. Um, if I go into kind of an adult degree completer, a lot of the empirical evidence would suggest that if I place those folks in kind of upper level classes and I get my faculty student ratio above about 30 to one, outcomes start to deteriorate very quickly. So we have to pay attention to those. But that's the whole point of running experiments and getting better and following the data and seeing how we're doing. So I, I get nervous when people say XYZ is not a good model because they're often talking from a, a values-based judgment as opposed to an empirical data-based judgment. So how should we, I mean, you mentioned the Ed Department recently changing their approach on this issue. Um, and yet, if you look at sort of public policy on student aid and the college experience, it seems like we have a really, we have differing pressures. One is the pressure, let's try new things. The other is, I think a lot of people in Washington right now are very much motivated by how do we prevent the next Corinthian? And there's a sense that uh, accreditors, policymakers didn't crack down soon enough and left a lot of students with debt and left a lot of the, the government uh, trying to help those students at huge expense. How do you balance support for these new approaches for learners without letting uh, people take advantage and make a lot of money off of students who don't know the difference between an exciting innovation and a lousy education? Take a stab at this one. Um, well, I think uh, traditionally in higher education, it's very much been an environment where we've said, trust us. We're PhDs, we know what's going on, we've got this. We don't need anyone to tell us how to assess our students. And that's definitely not the approach that was taken in K through 12. It was very much of a mandate approach of how students were gonna be tested and assessed. And what we're coming back to now is uh, some of the trust has been eroded, um, so we're, we're having to prove ourselves. And we're still asking that question, what does it mean to have a good assessment? And I think when we think of our traditional credit hour, the student goes to, uh, they take a course for 15 weeks, and at the end of the 15 weeks, they get a letter grade of an, an A through an F, and if you got an A, you, you totally, you learned everything that you needed to learn. And what we're seeing is that actually is not the case. What does an A mean? And I think that we're really getting down to some of these fundamental questions is what makes up a good assessment? And some of that we're still really trying to learn. I mean, especially I know with competency-based education, what we've seen is that we're wrestling with that question every day. We actually don't know to, a, to an exact degree what makes a good assessment. I think people are still trying to figure that out. You have faculty that are going at it on their own. They're assessing their courses. They're looking at the outcomes. And then when you think about it from an institutional perspective, how do you come up with assessments as a whole? And so I think that that's we need to take a step back and really try to think about that 
and how do we deal with those demanding pressures of something being mandated um, in a culture that we haven't had a lot of mandates, and how do we strike that balance? Robert? Yeah, I would say, um, you mentioned that, you know, how do we avoid um, outcomes like a Corinthian as we experiment things? Let's not forget, Corinthian was not in experimental sites. Right? True. Two yes. fundamental lines yeah. of business online, which hasn't been experimental for some time, and vocational education, which is under national accreditors, which are fairly stiff in terms of outcomes. Um, you know, so, and, and I would also say that the empirical outcomes at Corinthian, if you take some of the, you know, marketing things aside, but the empirical outcomes actually were equal to or exceeded a number of other, actually not a number, a vast number of other schools that are out there. So um, you're looking at an environment where I think we're collectively saying, are we satisfied with the outcomes? Um, and the Department of Education, um, now through experimental sites, starting to say, let's base more on outcomes. Um, accreditors who are starting to ask outcomes-based questions in visits. And I think you're just starting to see the beginning of a broad, in general, what I expect will be a long-term rotation towards rather than looking at inputs, right, looking at outputs in terms of, you know, how are things going. I think that's a healthy thing. Um, but at the same time, let's not throw out experimentation, throw out uh, providing, you know, access to different population groups um, from the bad outcomes of one or two or three. Or, or I would say, or 10 or 15, by the way. John, as you think about the qualities that you were saying are so important to students, how do you measure um, whether those, whether students are having those experiences and whether it is in fact equipping them with the skills they need to succeed in life? Well, um, I, I was thinking about that exact question, listening to this uh, conversation, and I don't know the degree to which young people, right, are kind of part of the conversations that we're having, on, you know, kind of in forums like this in Washington, et cetera, in, in, in terms of there are, um, there are tens of thousands of young people every single day who are creating content on this subject on various forms of social media, through blogs, through comments, through tweets and other things that would kill to be part of this conversation. And they may or may not be at different colleges and universities and institutions kind of around the country. So one thing I would suggest is that we begin to find national forums, and I know that the Department of Education does it in some way, um, national conversations where young people are kind of part of this dialogue want. But I think that the, that the answer to the question is, especially in terms of some of the online versions, is it's not meeting the standards and, 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 and giving tools necessary to young people to get a job. Because if they did, I don't think you'd see a major, uh, plurality of young people voting for Donald Trump in the Republican primary. I don't see you would, I don't think you would have a plurality majority of young people voting for Bernie Sanders as a Democrat primary. You know, these are examples of an extremely frustrated uh, electorate. The largest generation in the history of America and the world is extremely frustrated with all institutions. So the level of trust since I've been conducting the survey of 15 years on every major institution has gone down every single year with a couple of small exceptions. So when I go out in the middle of America, um, I go to Memphis, Tennessee, and other places, I see people literally breaking down and crying about kind of what their life is looking like at 20, 22 years old. They saw their families lose jobs, lose houses, lose other things, and very little opportunity for themselves in too, too many parts of America today. So from where I see, we're not there yet. I'm curious what you make of the fact that if you talk about institutions losing the respect of young people, um, if you look at the most elite colleges and universities, most of which are arguably the least likely to embrace these new modalities and new forms of education, and are the least likely to embrace assessment, because they would argue if you got in here, you must be smart, and if you passed for four years, you must be smart. Why do students continue to flock to prestige as opposed to real, you know, as opposed to the institutions that are doing these exciting new things and have more rigorous forms of assessment? I can only answer that question as a parent of, of, of three, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, I talk about being embedded, right, with millennials. I teach them at, uh, at Harvard. I have a company where almost everybody's a millennial, and I have, I have three. I have a, Robert and I have 21, 19, and 16 year olds. Um, so we're poor right now. So, Thanks, guys. Thank you. Right? Uh, 
and all three, I think, will go to one of your universities <laughs> in New England. Um, but that's, at least in towns where we come from, right, in south of Boston or west of Boston, that's what you're supposed to, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, I think that there's a culture within a lot of communities that you, you, have the, you have the tutor and you play the sports and you play the instrument in order to kind of, uh, kind of achieve this opportunity to apply to one of the elite schools represented here. Whether or not um, there's a, a kind of a better outcome at the end, it's to be determined. Personally, I think a liberal arts education is a better outcome for kind of my, the way in which I try to raise my kids, but I can tell you that um, there are, you know, many, many successful people um, who have flexibility, who, who can give back and have other opportunities outside of those prestigious um, school, outside of those prestigious things. But I think the, cu the culture um, that so many of us around the Boston area um, are part of is going to feed her through those, those schools. Maybe the right decision, maybe the wrong decision. Listen, I, I could paint very eloquently that you should search for the institution that meets your needs and that educates you the best, blah, 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 blah. If you get into Williams or MIT, you should probably go. On a risk-adjusted basis, outcomes are pretty hard to be bad, right? The problem is, not very many people get into Williams and MIT, right? And, and, and I apologize for the rest of you who are in the, quote, ultra-prestige level out here for not mentioning your name. So if you get into one of those schools, you should go, right? Like, and I would be hard-pressed to look any young person in the face and tell them that that's a bad idea. Um, unless they came to me with a really carefully articulated reason of why another institution fits their particular needs. But let's talk about the other 99% of students out there, right? They should be sitting down and thinking, what is it that I need? How, what type of educational experience am I looking for? Which institution fits me best? And once you start to think in that way, there are tons and there's 3,000, 4,000 institutions out there. There's always a couple good fits for you. Um, and if you're smart about the environment you're looking for, you should be able to find a good one. Can't help the jobs market, right, and things like that. But you know, I think you know part of the problem we run into is sometimes the exploration and search process is not aligned with reality. Um, one of the biggest determinants out there of whether somebody are, you know yields or matriculates into your school or not post admission is the weather on the day of the campus visit, right? Like, and and I'm not joking. That's actually statistically accurate, right? So when you think about that, that little pieces of information like that tell us that the that there's an inappropriate search and matching function going on out there for whatever reason. Um, and that's probably an area to focus on. I think that we also need to change the conversation about what community colleges can do for our students. Um, been conducting a lot of research lately around transfer, and what we're seeing is that two plus two is cheaper than starting at a, with a four-year yeah. institution. We know that students can get um, a lot of bang for their buck by starting at a two-year institution and then transferring. Um, but what we are seeing is that um, the transfer many times doesn't happen. That's right. Um, for those that do transfer, only about half actually finish their bachelor's degree. And so what can we do to engage students while they're at that two-year institution so that they can complete? We know that students that do complete the two-year uh, degree are coming out and they're able to make um, oftentimes more money than their four-year counterparts, especially in the, the medical areas. Um, a few years ago, Public Agenda, we conducted a series of interviews with, or focus groups with students in Indiana at their community colleges. And these focus groups were with students that did not complete, um, nor were they able to transfer. And what we saw was that the students, the blame always went right back to them. They kept saying, like, I should have known what it took to transfer. I should have known who I should have talked to. And what we're seeing is that oftentimes within the, the, the community colleges and the four-year institutions is that those uh, agreements for transfer don't happen. So a student can complete 60 plus credits, whatever they need to do in order to transfer. And many of them actually don't in fact transfer so that a student comes in as junior standing. Um, and what we saw was the main determining factor for a student coming in at that junior standing was that they had to talk to the chair of the department that they wanted to transfer into. And how many students at a community college actually know that? How many faculty know that's who you need to talk to? Probably not the case. And what we're doing is it's a real disservice for our students so that they can come in and that they can see the value of these two-year institutions. They can come in, get what they need, and then transfer at a junior standing, or they can come out and they can have a degree and they're ready to get a job in case they don't actually complete the four-year degree. And so I think that by changing some of that conversation, I, I 
checked out the attendee list before um, this morning, and I saw that there are a lot of community college representatives here in the room, and being able to change that conversation because many of our students are not getting into those elite institutions, and what can we do to encourage that, whether it be at the high school level or whenever they're coming back, to say that community colleges are a good option for our students. Well, you know, it's interesting, and particularly, I was recently at a conference in Florida talking about this issue, and in Florida, the four-year universities, public universities, do not have any space for students, right. and the population is booming. And as a result, starting at community college is now the normal way, the, you know, the standard way to earn a bachelor's degree in Florida. And when it becomes standard, not unusual, the negotiations change. Um, all of a sudden, the community colleges aren't begging for articulation agreements. Um, they are, frankly, imposed on them. They, they don't need them in Florida because they have a common course catalog. Right, right. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 but, but, but it translates to the yeah. individual level. That if, you tra if you're a junior in biology, the professor can't say, I don't like the training you received at such and such yeah. a community college. They just can't do that. And I think in parts of the country where you have a certain demographic shift are ahead maybe of parts of the country where there are still spaces at many institutions. But if we talk about, say, the community college learner, um, are there other, how can, how can colleges, um, you know, how can a system help the community college learner if that's going to become more, more of the standard? Yeah, you know, there, there's vast differences between the population groups that different community colleges serve. So Florida is a great example. California very much yeah. so as well, where you have a system that is so taxed out that for all but a very, very few students, the only way to get through the system is to start in a community college. Um, Florida and a few other states have a common course catalog, which means if I take XYZ in this campus, it is the same in every single campus. There's no discussion. There's no negotiation of articulation agreements. It is one course catalog throughout all 39 colleges and universities. So that's one system you can put in place. I would say the larger problem you run into is that um, it, it, your example of a two plus two, right? Getting your two plus two degree, two years in the community college, and then two years either at the state school or many private institutions, economically sounds fantastic. The question is what happened in the first two, right? And the alarming thing is that the outcomes at many community colleges throughout the United States are alarmingly low. So if you're starting your two at an institution that has a 10% graduation or transfer rate, that's bad odds. Right? So the most important thing we can do, I think, in community colleges, which primarily are reaching out to students who are going to have academic challenges, is to make sure we have sufficient career services and support and student support services in there so that when you hit the predictable bump in a the road, there's someone there monitoring and reacting and supporting the person. And so as I look at that, you know, for, for a student who would have normally gotten into the four-year school who's pushed out into the community college to start there, they probably have decent outcomes. I'm more concerned about the student who's in the community college who probably wouldn't have been there 15 years ago, who needs a deep amount of academic support, uh, or not even academic, it's more social support and emotional support, um, and whether there's sufficient money in the budget to, to provide that, right? Because that's an area where another dollar there versus in other areas can have a fairly dramatic impact. Um, I want to ask you about students who may not be there right now, or the, the, the potential learner. And if you look at, say, the free community college idea, it's premised on the idea that there are lots of students, or potential students, who if it were free, would come. Because we know that, we know that with Pell Grants for low-income students, community college is already free. effectively free. But there's this idea, and so far the numbers in Tennessee are backing it, that you make it free as opposed to it will be free if you fill out all these forms you get new students. Are they a group of learners we should be paying more attention to? And do you think free community college or free public higher education entirely, if you take the Bernie Sanders plan, um, that uh, educators should be thinking about? Uh, the one, one thing I'll just add to that is we, one of, we, and we release all of our surveys, we do two surveys a year. They're on the website at um, Institute of Politics at Harvard. Um, we asked uh, community college um, students um, what, why they were there and what impact uh, price and uh, tuition had. And I believe 
almost 90% said they chose a community college primarily because of money, right? So that argues for if it were free, more people could have, I think, would go. And if money weren't a concern, a lot of those community college students would be a kind of applying for kind of other, other um, kinds of university states and privates as well. I think that um, without, without question, there are kind of a lot of kind of, kind of points of this debate that are kind of are worth thinking about, specifically as it relates to the community college around the idea of, of, of a specialty learning, right, in terms of, kind of outcomes based, so people have a clear indication in terms of what skills they'll come out of, they'll, they'll have it within a couple of years, is I know it's a political idea, I'm not too sure that the way in which um, that's been translated into kind of uh, the education space as well, but that's something I think that would resonate at least with the young people that kind of we talk to and communicate with. Robert? Um, it's good. So, I'm a liberal Democrat, so I believe in free education. That said, there's some problems that come with making everything free. Um, I think from a policy perspective, we have to ask ourselves, what's the objective function of free education? Is it to engage more people in an academic environment, or is it to generate more graduates from an academic environment? Those are vastly different things. So in Tennessee, the question will be, for those who we have upticked the participation rate, what are the outcomes? We may be happy, actually, with an outcome that engages a lot more young people in our education system who don't graduate, right? Because evidence would show that any amount of further education is good for human, good for society. So if, if, as long as we go in eyes wide open and say our objective here is to engage more people, but on, expectation that only a few of them will ultimately graduate, then that's a fine expenditure of money. I, you just have to ask yourself. I will tell you that the market at large is not that elastic. Right, so the market is fairly inelastic at you know overall. So lowering the cost of education does increase the number of students, but not nearly at the rate that most people presume. Filling gaps in funding, which is what Pell well Pell makes it free, but which is what loans do, that actually really drives the marketplace. So uh, you know, and at some level, I think you have to say if I have X dollars out there. Who do I want to distribute those dollars to? Community college is fairly low cost as it is. I'm not sure that that's, if we need to be putting money into the hands of you know, semi-wealthy people um, who could have afforded that to begin with. I'd rather take it and apply it to more Pell Grants or something like that, but that's a personal choice. Aaron? Um, from my understanding with Tennessee is that it's, um, the, the freeness of it is only for those students that are recent high school graduates. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, there's a subset it's of the population course. that is not being able to take advantage of this wonderful benefit. And it's really what we're seeing is it's this other population um, that has been out of school for a while that we do need to think about how can we get them in um, if they are finding that they need to go to school in order to get a degree. So what we're hearing from students is the number one reason why they go to college is so that they can get a good job. So how do, we make that, how do we make that possible for them to come in and to get a good job? Um, and so whether it's free or not, um, you have to ask yourself at, you know, who's, at whose cost are we doing that? We're seeing that with states that there is a, a lower amount of money being um, provided for our state institutions. So who, who, where is this going to come from? So I ask that from the practical standpoint, if we do make it free, but where is this money coming from? It's not like money growing on trees, so we have to think from the state perspective, um, where is it coming from? And then how are we gonna get those students that do need to come in so that they can get a good job, how can we bring them in in a low cost and an effective way um, so that they can come in and get the training that they really do need? Um, to, to answer some of the questions that Robert raised, from the early reporting on, on Tennessee, and obviously the program is so new that we don't know mm -hmm. anything about outcomes, um, definite enrollment boosts at the community college is significant. Um, and, and some declines at some of the regional publics, but the evidence suggests that people are not um, switching from the flagship or from the elite privates to community colleges. And that sort of makes sense because if the wealthy, better prepared students were cost conscious, they would already be going to community colleges. So they are already showing a willingness to spend more. The thing that I find really interesting about the debate over, well, do people really need it? Do these students really need it? 
is you compare the debate over a free community college to the debate over uh, hope style programs that are um, basically tax credits for upper middle class students, which tend to result in hardly anyone new going to college, but may encourage students to go to the state flagship over an out of state private. That is like a political sacred cow in many states. <laughs> and nobody asks tough questions about it. And in times of tight budgets, everyone rallies around it. Um, perhaps those <laughs> learners are considered more important than other learners. Uh, just, just throwing that out there as a cynical journalist. Um, I want to open it up to uh, the audience here. We have two mics and invite uh, people to come to the mics and ask questions of the panel on anything related to uh, who are the learners or what we've been talking about. And if uh, you do choose to ask a question, and you're all being very shy right now, um, I hope that you will also introduce yourself and the institution so that we know who's asking. The mics are, we can go on, but, but I do want to <laughs> let you all join as well. I see, I see a few brave people, yes. Hi, I'm Linda Grisham. I'm at Mass Bay Community College, which is out in Wellesley, and I agree with what the panelists are talking about, uh, needs for uh, advising. The issue is resources. Um, in Massachusetts, half of the students who are in public higher ed are at the community colleges. And to me, it's like a miracle what happens there with so few resources that are there. Students need resources. Co-op would be a great thing for many of my students. And the other thing is uh, the students are coming with a lot of challenges. And we really don't have the resources. And I mean, our staff does amazing jobs, but we still don't have the number of people to really provide the kind of advising that our students really need. So, um, like some suggestions, I mean, it's really a political question, really, to me. How much, if we're going to be serious about uh, embracing new learners, expanding the pool of learners, how much of it is about resources and willingness to provide colleges with more so they can help more different students with high needs? I think to some degree resources are important, but there are also some, some certainly some low cost things that we can do both at the two year level and at the four year level. So there's a, a movement and it was kind of alluded to when we got started with this guided pathways movement. So if you think of a cheesecake factory menu, it's like super long, like 20, 25 pages long of choices and it could take you forever to pick what you want for dinner. And that's kind of the, the experience that students are coming in. They look at their course catalog and there's so many choices and I don't know what to take and I could take you know 120 credits before I actually decide to transfer and then I transfer and I probably don't even have a degree. So there are some low cost things that we can do to help our students. We can shorten the pathway, we can give them more guided pathways and that's a really low cost way that the faculty can come together. They can think about, okay, if a student is gonna graduate or if they're gonna major in this, you know, how are we choosing and how are we refining what courses we offer so that students can come in, they have a clear direct path towards whatever course they're gonna take and whatever major they're gonna major in so that they can transfer and that's something that in terms of advising and working with faculty that those are really cost effective ways that don't always require a lot of resources that institutions can do. So I think that we, so my, my long answer to that is I think that we need to, as opposed to saying that we just need more money, we need more money, what can we do with what we have and what are some techniques that we can engage in in order to create those changes? Robert, John? Yeah, so I, you know, we can always do more with less, right? So let's accept that through continued process improvement, et cetera, et cetera, we can do more with less. So let's take that and put that to the side for a minute. Um, I, I think we've become a little overly obsessed with the cost of education right now. And I'm not saying that it's not, that it, not too high. I'm not saying that it, we can't reduce it, but we have to make choices. If I can reduce the cost of a student's degree by $5,000, let's start with that as a premise. The question is, what should I do with the $5,000, right? And if I'm actually trying to generate return on economic investment or educational investment for the student, typically speaking, I'm better off taking that $5,000 and investing it behind persistence and career services rather than putting the money back in the pocket of the student. And I think that's missed in the conversation at times, that of course we'd like things to be cheaper, 
but what we really like is value for the money that we spend. And so taking that money and putting it where it has the highest impact is often not back in the student's pocket, but actually behind the services. And, and those are typically the services that, um, that, that, that you were mentioning right there, right? Like, how can I get the student support services to get my graduation rate up by another 10%, which really moves the needle? Um, what can I do to get, you know, 5 to 10% of my students a better job than I had before? Um, those are fantastic places to put money, particularly as I move down to schools that are serving more challenged students. The one, the one thing I would add, again, kind of from, from the place where I sit, is that um, I mentioned that this generation, the largest generation uh, in the history of America, in this presidential campaign, more people under 30 will vote than over 65, just the sheer size of the generation, which means that there's, poli yes, right, will be the third time. Uh, so it means incredible political capital that you, that you have. So in, in every, in Congress and in Massachusetts and in most legislators, legislatures now, you have the, a millennial caucus. I think close to a quarter of all state senators in Massachusetts are close to being millennials. Millennials are the oldest, is about 35 years old now. There's a handful of them under that age and, and several more kind of in their late 30s. This is one of the primary concerns of this generation in every survey that we take in terms of the quality of education. So I would kind of encourage uh, you, your faculty, your students to kind of engage within the political process and make this, uh, make this a reality because the good news is that there's enough people, there's enough of a constituency to have more meaningful political dialogue than perhaps you could have had you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Just, just to follow on the point about uh, student services and using your resources there, there's some really interesting research that shows there's a direct relationship between spending on academic advising and graduation rates. And, but what happens, particularly in economic downturns like post-2008, uh, college leaders, for good reasons, try to protect the number of sections of courses they offer and minimize tuition increases. And so during those periods, academic advising tends to get gutted. And, 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 it, and there's, it's not as sort of sexy to say, we're going to add academic advisors as it is to say we're freezing tuition or we're adding new programs. And yet so much research shows that's really what changes things. Yes. Hi, Donna Linderman, City University of New York. I, I'd be very interested in hearing from the panelists your thoughts on assessing these alternative modalities that were mentioned because as we think about measuring what students have learned, how do we as uh, faculty and institutional leaders assess the quality of online, hybrid mm -hmm. um, opportunities, as well as, as well as internship and out of the classroom experiences? Because I think we have a, an obligation to, to look inward as well, to see if we're doing a good job. And then uh, the second part of the question is um, thinking about costs as we think about free tuition. How, how do we invest in um, really looking at the quality of what we are offering our students both in and out of the classroom. Anyone want to jump at that? Sure. Um, I'm going to talk about the assessment piece first. Um, and this is just based on recent research. So um, in looking at uh, what's going on with competency-based education, what we're seeing is that there's not one universal way for how competency-based education is offered. Um, there's not one way for how the faculty model is done. There's not one way to think about assessments. And so those are the conversations that are starting to happen. What are the best types of assessments that institutions can offer for their students? Um, is it uh, something that happens real time every day? Or do we wait until the end of the semester to make that happen? Traditionally, we've waited until the end of the semester in order to assess our students. What we're seeing is that that real-time assessment every day, um, the invasive analytics, making sure that we're aware of what happens um, to students if they're not showing up to class, if they're not turning in their assignments. What we're starting to see is that that's a trend that, that's really helping the students give them that real-time feedback. But as a whole, we haven't really taken, um, we haven't taken stock of is there one correct way to do it. And I think that we, at, in large, um, in academia, we, we want to have that freedom, but how can we have that freedom that um, also allows the institution to come together to figure out 
you know, are we going to take one particular stance on assessment, or is it going to be a faculty by faculty by faculty, course by course? And what we're seeing is that when students are faced with those examples of um, every single faculty member assesses in a different way, and every single course is being assessed in a different way, that's confusing to a student. Mm -hmm. They're not really, really sure how they're supposed to demonstrate, and so thinking about can we make things a bit more standardized within the institution, um, I think that's a really good start. Did you Stop just coin invasive analytics? I love that term. That's fantastic. I don't, I don't think I coined it, but... I'm um, using it for now. Okay, use it's it. It's a good one. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, it, what you said is, is so spot on. You know, it, it, today in a, in a traditional traditional classroom setting environment, I would challenge most institutions to demonstrate that they have a way to evaluate the learning institution-wide, right? We rely on faculty members to do that, right? So it's the accumulation of my faculty members saying that, yes, learning has occurred. But there's no measurement, if you will, at an institution-wide. As we move into these, uh, you know, alternative modalities and alternative assessment processes, I think the world is wide open, right? Like w one of the fundamental purposes of education is to increase critical thinking, right? Non-cognitive skills and things like that. We can measure that, right? There are assessments now that purport to measure that and measure it well. Um, the question is, do you want to use them, right? So, um, and I think you're going to see a, a, a tremendous change in that, and it's going to be different assessments for different purposes. I, to me, one of the big ones that is, is kind of left unanswered right now is when I go into using MOOCs, particularly when I get into public education, a fully online, you know, basically no faculty member MOOC for general education, right? Who wrote the test, right? Like, is it balanced? Has it been done by psychometricians? Is it fair to all different population groups out there? And I think when you get into an area like that, there's going to be an emerging demand for a very rigorous scientifically based test that really is fair to all students. As I move into upper level classes, I'll probably still continue to rely on faculty members to do it, right? Because I'm dealing with different population groups. So I think we're going to see this big evolvement. I, mean, I think, you know, <clears throat> the fundamental question in, in most assessments is, what am I purporting to have taught? And then how do I measure it? And I think as long as you go out with that attitude and reflect and improve over time, this will all work out well. There's but quality yeah, assessments out see, there. See, I would say actually the, the whole critical thinking area is a huge Achilles heel for colleges. Everybody. Because yeah. colleges, especially colleges that don't like uh, standardized assessment, love to say, well, but we are focused on critical thinking and that's what we do well. And then some of them will also, a lot of them will do the CLA or whatever test and say, look how great we are at critical thinking. AAC and you came out with a study last year that you should all read if you are quoting the critical thinking thing. And Richard um, They asked graduating college seniors, are you good in all these areas that you would think of associating with critical thinking, can communicate well, can write well, can work in teams, can analyze tough questions, and guess what? The students think they're great. And at many of their institutions, the CLA scores suggest they're great as well. But then AACNU asked hiring employers, employers that hire new college graduates, are the students good in all these areas? And they got like D and F grades. And so now that's not to say that the employers are necessarily right, but there's a lot of self-congratulations about critical thinking that I'm not sure always can really be demonstrated. Yes. Uh, Stephen Dill. Uh, director of Marketing at uh, Wheelock College here in Boston, and uh, thanks to the panel for, for this time. The uh, learner segment that I haven't heard addressed directly yet is, uh, we could loosely call it professional de development. It's the post-grad. Mm -hmm. uh, we often see it in groups. We used to, a lot of these institutions used to make a lot of money off it. There just wasn't a whole lot of cost to it, so there was a nice margin. MOOCs, it could be said, address some of that marketplace, but the reality is that most of these institutions are not ho hosting MOOCs. So, uh, so it's a group that really has disappeared on us, and it's gone off to a lot of for-profit uh, entities, and or it's gone into you know internal corporate learning centers, et cetera. But uh, how do we bring those back? We're struggling with how do we get them back because it's not just about a um, a graduate certificate program that's maybe four cor courses. It could also be the non-matric student, which used to be a classic model of bringing in an alumni. Uh, because they just wanted to get smart on what's going on in this human growth and development or whatever the topic. Uh, where is that group gone and where is that learning group uh, being addressed? Split in two directions, right? So if you go into kind of corporate executive education group, it's moved and migrated to about 10 brands in the world. 
and it's about a billion and a half dollar market, right? So it's actually still there, it's still very vibrant, and still growing at about four to six percent per annum, right? But that's, that's one segment, and it's, it's migrated to brands, right? Mostly because it's now can be done virtually um, or in a hybrid fashion, right? And so once I do that, I free myself from space, and boom, global brands win. The other, as you pointed out, is actually moved more towards proprietary schools because they were more reactive to the needs of the marketplace. There's no other reason for it to have migrated to proprietary schools other than that they marketed for it, they aggressively courted corporations, um, they tended to invest into the um, classroom environment, particularly when you get into medical and areas like that, to put in an operating theater and things like that. Um, but you know, the brands don't necessarily support that. So I'd say that marketplace is still there for the taking. It just moved on you a little bit. Um, and the third one, you know, the, uh, the concept of an adult learner who's dropping in to just learn something, that human has by and large disappeared, right? So unless you're granting them a certificate that has tangible market value, they're not all that interested anymore, right? But with tangible market value, it's there. And, and you know, in the last uh, 36 months, not even that, more like 24 months, we've had an explosion in that group right there in the form of coding boot camps and data analytic boot camps and things like that. Primarily students about 26 years old, have an undergraduate degree, typically from a pretty good institution, struggling in the job market, 10 weeks, $10,000, double my income, right? Now that's a tangible market value certificate, and so it's resonated. And this year we will probably graduate almost as many students from those collective boot camps as we do from the collective associated master's programs in computer science, which should be a little scary if you run a master's degree in computer science out there. So we're, we're getting <coughs> tight on time, so I wonder if, if the last two questioners could each do their questions first, and then we'll try to address them together. Sure. Uh, Mario Martinez from National University System based in San Diego, California. Uh, we're 60% online. We serve primarily adults, 40% face-to-face. And um, I was just wondering, I, we're interested in the next five years of understanding the complex dynamic of modality mix and duration that best serves adults. And by duration, I mean one month format, semester at another point in time, could be three weeks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that we're also open to and interested in learning that I didn't hear the panel address is for profits because it's not very popular to talk about them these days. But we believe that there are probably good practices and things that we can learn from them, even though their stocks are in the tank and uh, they are certainly the popular to uh, be rate nowadays. Uh, but I was wondering from the panelists if there's principles or best practices that we can take as nonprofits that will help us particularly with the adult population as we think about the next two to five years. And our last question, which we'll combine. Hi, Larry Abel from the Institute of Academic Leadership and retired provost. I don't, I don't think any of these problems are solely resource driven. They're really attitudinal driven. It's the attitude of four years working with two-year schools. It is the attitude that um, we can't afford something. If you can get two students to persist, that on a four-year campus, you can hire another academic advisor. Because as we've heard, the single biggest return on your dollar are academic advisors. And linking them with two-year and four-year will make that transition so much easier. Remember how hard it is for someone with no background in education at a two-year school to look at a four-year school and say, I can navigate that incredible, needless maze. Great point. Do um, you want to respond to either of those? Sure. I'll, I'll respond to the for-profit one. Um, and this is coming from the perspective of both being inside academia and then my time outside of academia is um, the nimbleness that for-profits have. They're able to be very reactive and they're able to change on a whim. And I'm not saying that being able to change things on a whim is necessarily good, but when we think about the, the timetable it takes in traditional higher education, it's very slow. Um, having worked with um, many faculty, you know, we talk about in the beginning of the semester, um, well, we can't do things at the beginning of the semester because it's the beginning of the semester. You get into the middle of the semester, you can't do things right now because we're almost towards finals. And then we can't get another course in because the course catalog's all done for the year, and we got to wait all the way until next year, and then that's taking in, 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 into account whether or not it was approved by the Academic Senate. So just kind of that pace and that m mentality that we have 
um, and being able to be reactive to our learners and what the learners need. I think that that's a really good example of something that we can learn from the for-profits. I will say that having that academic senate and being deliberative in how we make decisions, that's a good thing, but we just might need to speed up the pace a little bit so that we can be reactive to our students. Do either of you want to add to that? You can buy a for-profit right now. They're pretty cheap. Convert it into a non-profit. <laughs> they have all those wonderful capabilities. Um, you know, you ask, are there best practices? Of course there's best practices. The best practices across all institutions. Um, but for-profits have been very, very agile at doing things like you asked. Um, should I do two online courses at once or should I go to short six-week courses back-to-back? -back? Depends on your population group. You've got a highly challenged group, back-to-back, -back, no breaks. Right? You end on Friday, you start on Monday because every time I give you a break, the probability of you stepping out is high. In fact, I should give you a discount. Right? So you'll see a lot of for-profits. You're maintaining a beer better average. You continue to take the next course. I give you a tuition discount. Why? I'm shaping behavior. I know if you take six weeks off, your probability of completing just dropped on me. And then lots of money on student supports. Last thing I'll say is engage your students. They want to help you through these, through these challenges. Engage them. There are a lot of answers sitting on your campus right now wanting to be engaged. Um, I would just suggest on the for-profits, people still have too much of an image in mind of the old for-profits. Go on the General Assembly website and look at the way they are packaging themselves and look at what we and others have reported about the way they are not trying to base it on federal student aid, but charging a reasonably high price and saying they will be able to demonstrate that value. I think that may pose a greater threat than some of the traditional for-profits may. And it's not just coding academies. They're much broader in what they do, but with the boot camp style. So clearly we have a lot with learners.